We are actually, there is a, a conference going on in Scotland right now on RPL, and we are actually connecting, trying, hopefully, connecting with them this morning through go-to meetings for just about 10 or 15 minutes prior to the start of the next session. It's the end of their conference, the end of their day. So in Scotland, it is uh, quarter to four, and they have had a long conference day. By the way, I'm Gail Hall and have been working here with the International Prior Learning Assessment Network for CAPLA. So we had um, experimented with this a few days ago and actually worked in connecting, but they're of course in now in a hotel and the joys of trying to make technology work. They're, they were on here on the webcam a moment ago. Hello, Gail. Yes, hi, Margaret. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. We hey. Can you hear me? Oh, you've got it. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well, Gail, thank you very much for our link. We have managed successfully to connect with you, which is good. We were beginning to wonder if we were going to, to be able to, to hear you. Absolutely. So, Margaret, we're going to turn it over to you right now to give us a quick overview from Scotland and just what you've done in your conference today for a couple of moments. I know it's been a long day for you. It has indeed. We've been here since early morning. There's been 80 odd people here today, which was a greater number than we had expected in terms of our plans were for 50. So we were absolutely delighted when we were able to get so many people to engage with us with about RPL. And very early on in the morning, our first speaker was our, our, our Chief Executive of the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework Partnership. As you know, here we have disappeared. As you know, the, we have a, a national framework in, in Scotland, which um, we're very lucky to have. And uh, Aileen was um, really just uh, emphasising the importance of us engaging with a wide range of stakeholders in terms of the recognition of prior learning and that the priorities for the partnership were around capacity building and the wider use of the framework, employer engagement and recognising wider achievement. Um, if your colleagues in Canada are interested in looking at our SCQF website uh, on www.scqf.org.uk, we have a range of video clips where there is um, some um, colleagues giving their experience, employers and others giving their experience of using the framework as a tool for lifelong learning. And I would recommend you that you have a look at that. Um, we have been talking today about the use of our RPL toolkit. You may have remember last year, I, I brought a couple of toolkits along with me and ex explained how we were using them. And my colleague Julie has further developed that into toolkits for using with school pupils and also for redundancy for those facing redundancy. So there's huge interest in that. Um, we were looking at Europe and Aileen was talking very much about the European agenda where the European validation guidelines for member states um, should, has stated that the member states should implement a, a validation process by 2015 that all member states should have a comprehensive and systematic national arrangements for the validation of non-formal and informal learning so that gives us huge challenges in how we're going to respond to that and um, we also then heard from a sector skills council our land-based um, sector skills council called Lantra and he um, the our speaker there talked about the need for um, recognizing prior learning due to the aging workforce that's there and also the rapid change within the industry and also the increasing regulation that's uh, requiring that people's skills are recognized really. So a huge um, uh, amount of development work has gone on there and uh, they have developed some very comprehensive online toolkits that have been geared to the sector and uh, customised to each of the different areas in that sector so that it's relevant for individuals to put down where their skills are and how they're using these skills and, and having these skills recognised by the profession. We then went, uh, we had our workshops, we had five workshops, one on our RPL policies and our Scottish Qualifications Authority, 
one about using the toolkit within the uh, community development sector, using uh, RPL in the national health sector here, and RPL in, in higher education, and using RPL within the sector, uh, the social services sector. So, discussion and debate about how to best use the RPL in these sectors and how to value the skills of then went up to Wales, another part of the UK, and we heard about the uh, about the uh, opportunity in Wales for the RPL within the nuclear industry, about its impact to economic development, and how they are using RPL to um, people skills recognised in terms of the uh, recognition of um, opportunities, accredited level units being able to award. Uh, learners units that are on the qualification credit framework and the credit qualification framework in Wales. So huge diversity in terms of that and then we went to a little bit about Bahrain and my experience there. So we've had quite a full day really in terms of, um, of RPL. So what are you going to be talking about today? Well Margaret, we've as um, you've been here before at conferences, so we've just finished the pre-conference day in Canada yesterday have to think about which day it is. Um, yesterday, where there were actually three, four workshops, one on 360 degrees looking at RPL and how it is beyond the credential assessment in looking at internationally educated and more integration of other RPL, RPL um, tools and resources and processes within that inter international credential recognition. There was another one from the Association of Community Colleges in Canada, and they were looking and discussing on transfer articulations and ability, much like uh, you're looking at within the European community, and good RPL practices, partnerships with employers, and uh, looking in both of the workshops, I noted a, a high emphasis on the quality assurance of RPL. And then another introduction to RPL for those who are just beginning in terms of in being able to do the recognition of prior learning in Canada. We have two days of full workshops coming up today and tomorrow, and they are too varied in order to be able to uh, mention them all. But what I'll do is actually, um, you know, we'll send you a little bit of a summary and we'll send you the link to the website where the sessions from CAPLA will be on CAPLA's and the Recognition for Learning website later. So we'll make sure that your network has that so we can start the exchange. I think the other thing to note is the webinars that IPLAN is starting to do between countries. And we did do one with Australia, with the Australian-Canadian exchange uh, about a month ago now which was uh, really successful. The first time I've had to talk about two different dates with the same event, uh, you know, Thursday in Canada and Friday in Australia, so you had to be careful what you were talking about in terms of days, but that went very well. Now, we had talked about uh, going with your network as well and looking at the potential for future webinars with your group and seeing where the interests may lie from the people that are within your Scottish network. We had actually circulated a list of topics of interest that have come from individuals and groups before and followed up with some of the interest also from Australia. Did you have a chance to talk about that? We put the leaflet into our packs and I've had a number of them return to me. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll analyze that information in terms of the areas of interest and then get that to you and we can then start to set up webinars across and we will highlight them in our, our SDQF literature and on our website in terms of making sure that people have the dates and the contacts. From what we, uh, our discussions today, certainly the themes that came out of, of all of the conference I think today was the need for clarity across learning uh, for learners and for providers, just exactly what we mean by RPL and, and what's the responsibility of the learner and what's the responsibility of the provider and uh, etc. And we also felt there was a need for streamlining processes because it can be, um, we need to make sure that we're cost effective, but also that it meets the needs not just of groups of people, but also individuals. 
um, and there would be individuals with diverse learning that they would want to have recognised and valued on our framework in terms of, and also for job opportunities and employers and how they put that within their CVs and, and all of that kind of um, area that needs to be really thrashed out, I think, in terms of how people do that. And then, of course, there's the big, um, the big one is, of course, funding. How does that be is supported by funding either from government or from other sources and, and um, that's that I think is the issues across across the globe at the moment in terms of how, how are these things going to be funded okay in in finishing Margaret just in in looking at this uh, initial connection with your network hopefully this can be more network to network type of activities that we're doing and we will um, take a look with your group afterwards about when always the question is timing in the sense of being able to uh, connect with the most people within different countries. So we'll, we'll discuss with you later because what we found is looking at some exchanges, we obviously can't go to Australia and Europe at the same time or people are up in the middle of the night. But we will take a look at you to see when we might be able to do some exchanges with the UK and other countries which are within that same time zone area. So we really appreciate your coming on today and doing this. I am both thrilled and relieved that it worked. So am I. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you folks over there and we will definitely be in touch in looking at future connections and exchanges with Scotland and the UK and the resources over there. And I know you're very connected with what's happening in Europe as well, so we'll look forward to uh, future and stronger connections. Thank you to everybody there. And you know what? We were going to plan with the webcam here. Actually, just while we finish off, because this is the end, people just come up here quickly and we'll go to this webcam. Just come on up behind here. Just come on in and wave and you can show everybody. Yeah, we need to we'll let them show themselves first. We have, um, I would say maybe, we have maybe 50 people here, Margaret, so I'm not sure we can all get into the same little webcam. But everybody can sort of... A few familiar faces there. <laughs> Hello to everybody. Next time, Margaret, we'll do the we'll do the full webcams that we can get the full groups. That's it. Absolutely, we'll, we'll get more experience as this as we go along. This is our first attempt. Okay. <laughs> thank you ever so much, okay. folks. At that end, we'll talk to you shortly. Thank you, Gail. Take Bye care. Just, uh, bye. So we'll we'll do a little bit of break here because I know some of you were coming in just for this session with Scotland. Um, in the future, this was the first time we'd actually tried connecting without not individual computers with individuals at their office or home, but tried to connect a group to a group. So, um, and that's part of why we did it for like. 10 minutes instead of <laughs> longer. So hopefully we may be able to do this kind of exchange with conferences in the future. So we'll just do about a three or four minute break at the moment. The next session where we are going on to talk about the RPL practitioner competencies and some of the uses of the competencies and looking at it from uh, a different perspective. A number of you who were on the webinar with Australia there will be some repetition in terms of what's being presented here to what was on the Australian webinar. And then we'll be bringing in a little bit at the end about the approach from a couple of other countries. So please feel free if you were on that webinar and don't want to stay for this session. I know there are a lot of good efforts on. So we'll just take about two minutes here while we get reorganized. And uh, then we'll carry on with this. Thank you. So this morning, we're going to take a look at uh, it's sort of a combination of things here from the perspective of the International Prior Learning Assessment Network and from CAPLA's um, RPL Standards Working Group. And Deb may correct me on that name afterwards, but the aspect here is that some of the work we have been doing with the International Prior Learning Assessment Network throughout the world and with other countries has been the interest in partially defining 
the competencies of an RPL practitioner, what they really need to do, and from there then, what kind of resources and support we can provide to practitioners. And so we're going to take a look at this from both um, a Canadian perspective, and we're going to take a look also at a few things that may be happening in other countries. And I'm just wondering from the perspective, uh, there are a few too many people for everybody to introduce themselves individually, but I'm wondering here, I think we have people from a few other countries here, right? So looking at IPLAN, the International Prior Learning Assessment Network and what it is, it's another in terms of volunteer networks such as CAPLA, and over the last uh, two or three years, there's been a little bit of discussion about exactly what the focus of IPLAN might be and what the, the most um, efficient and effective way of sharing things with other countries, recognizing that it's all based on volunteer interaction and volunteer resources. And basically, it's come down to sharing of resources, sharing of experiences in order to again come up with some kind of consistency where possible in terms of some of the commonalities since many people are mobile from one country to other both in terms of those who participate in working with RPL in other words advisors assessors and those who work with systems and from learners particularly moving more and more between countries both to uh, go to school and to work. So there has been a great interest in some of the things and you noticed from the listing of the interest categories that were there for people for future webcasts or webinars, the type of things like let's identify if we can the kind of common core competencies that we expect of people when they um, are able to work, move between countries. Now in Canada we have essential skills and we have employability skills. In other countries through their national qualification frameworks they identify that kind of core competency, call them different things and they're not necessarily categorized in the same way that we do. For example, maybe categorized in some areas on problem solving, on working with others, some of these things that at one point in Canada we had some advanced essential skills type of, in that type of thing. So there's been interest globally in saying if we're going to be helping people develop things like portfolios and prove their learning, are there some of these core areas that we could all look at concentrating on so that it's easier for people to demonstrate and prove their learning globally. So that's one of the kinds of things. The other types of things in terms of resources, you heard Margaret referencing a toolkit that they have developed in Scotland and it's a toolkit for their practitioners to again try and bring some consistency, provide them with some of the tools, back to the quality assurance that she mentioned and they're starting now into some of the training of RPL practitioners. So IPLAN really is looking at how we can share some of these resources, not just within Canada, but on a global basis, because there is a lot of similarity. We can learn from one another, and again, without necessarily reinventing the wheel. And again, in the last bullet, sharing principles of good practice and that being the benchmark then for the quality assurance that we're all looking for throughout the world. Initially, what we did with IPLAN was we would have somebody from another country speak at the CAPLA conference It's in, in order to exchange from that particular country. Now with technology, when it works, the, we're able to do it on a more ongoing basis through types of things like webinars or bulletin boards or exchanges, etc., online. So as we're moving forward with this, I plan we'll be looking at doing more webinars in exchanges on smaller topics such as we did with Australia on RPL practitioner competencies and how those are used. So that it can be a little more focused discussion from there in 
the sharing of resources. Um, I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but while I remember, I'm going to say it. One of the things that happened with the webinar with Australia is that they were sharing a whole number of their related resources. So you found then that we had a full frame, a full page of links to related resources in Australia that helped in terms of practitioner training, some of their training packages, etc. So it didn't need quite the same searching on our part to find the kinds of related resources that we were talking about on that webinar. So that kind of thing is very valuable. And you will find, by the way, if you weren't on that webinar, it is recorded and it is on the Recognition for Learning site. So you could go back and actually see it. So I've just talked about this exchange in Australia and some of the new challenges that we find in times. I have to go to the world clock so many times and see, because when we started the organization, Australia wasn't on daylight, and then they moved to daylight before we finished the promotion, so, um, it, but Canada wasn't. So anyway, just some of the, the new challenges as well as the new opportunities. So what we talked about in there with Australia, again, was looking at whether an RPL practitioner was considered as a role or whether it was part of a role of most people. Because we know that in Canada, with many people, as we've discussed in the, the last day and in previous years, many people who do RPL, they do it as part of another job that they have. So in this room, how many of you are only RPL, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean that in a very positive way. How many people, their role is RPL or PLAR, practitioner, advisor, assessor, or strictly RPL? That's great. That's great. So about half, I'd say. And so that, I think, is, I, I would say from those of you who Susan and Deb, that's increasing, right? In terms of the number who are actually roll strictly RPL. And then for the other, about half people, it becomes part of the role that you do. And so where do you get the connections, the training, et cetera, for the RPL? We found that in Australia, it is a big part of what they call their uh, vocational education, not so much of their university. So, you know, certain, certain commonalities in areas. And then we were looking at the potential for any kind of formal recognition and what they do in other countries. So, following that, so as I said, you can go on to the Recognition for Learning site. There is a new area on the site saying webinars. So that's where you will find recordings, not only of the ones through iPlan, but the last one that Kapla just did with the 360 degree um, assessment is on there as well now. And from there then, we can also put it up. It's on the discussion board, on the Recognition for Learning site. So if you go, it's www.recognitionforlearning.ca. And I'm sure there are um, promotional materials downstairs by the registration desk. The, with the discussion board as it is now, you can go on and you can read any of the discussions that are on there. In order to post, you actually have to become a member. It's free. And um, if you're like me, you'll write down your password so you can remember it, the things that you're not supposed to do. But if, in order to post, you do need to join to go on. But you can read and see what is happening. So that's the way we're starting to look at some of these links. Now, Australia has an RPL network as well. Theirs is called RON, Recognition of Learning Network. But honestly, it's RON. Um, but we're going to try and share with them between the two networks and the two boards so that we can make sure that the exchanges go and we can connect and link with both of them. And we'll do the same. Scotland doesn't yet have anything online, but they're coming up now with just the beginning of their, of their network. So with today's discussion here, we're going to move forward the discussion on RPL practitioner competencies 
and how they are used. We're going to take a look at what's been done in Canada through CAPLA and some of the other uh, areas and resources and a little bit about how some of the um, approach or thoughts in terms of a few of the international countries. So I'm going to call on Deb Blower, who is from the RPL facilitator at Red River College in Winnipeg, but the hat she is wearing today is chair of the RP of the Kaplas RPL Standards Working Group. Deb? Good morning, everyone. Nice to see a full room for this important topic. <laughs> I'm going to give you an overview of the work that CAPLA has done in partnership with a number of other organizations and institutions across Canada related to practitioner competencies. The first uh, slide that uh, up here on this slide, we are noting about the CAPLA RPL Standards Working Group. And this is actually a working group that CAPLA established in 2008 and developed a terms, uh, terms of reference. And essentially that group's purpose is to promote and facilitate discussion regarding the development of two types of standards. One set of standards would be for the field of practice and then another set of guidelines or standards for those who practice in the field. As part of the work of this committee, and many of you will remember this report, just brought it to jog your memory, the um, RPL Standards Working Group worked on a report called RPL Standards and Guidelines, Mapping the Road Ahead, A Call to Action, and we released that report in 2009. There was a very uh, robust working group of about uh, 14 committee members who reviewed the report. The report was written um, in consultation with the working group uh, by Lauren Waples, who many of you may know. Um, Lauren is with um, Red River College in Winnipeg. I know her well. And what came out of uh, that report were some recommendations around how to move forward. We also wanted to talk a little bit today about CAPLA's PLAR practitioner competencies. And I'm going to share with you some information about those competencies. I just would like a brief show of hands of the numbers who have either looked at those competencies or are somewhat familiar with them, have used them in their work. Oh, great. Good. Good. Thank you. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future work because there is a definite need for future work. So the emphasis um, in some of our early work, and I know there are people in this room that were part of this early work, and those of you that picked up uh, the um, benchmarks uh, information, it's down on the CAPLA table, and it's the one with the uh, Canadian uh, maple leaf on the front of it. But this early work was done to research the roles of those who practice in the PLAR or RPL field. And there was a significant piece of research. We had a cross-Canada committee uh, working on this piece of research. But Malcolm Day and Paul Zakos put together this research on developing benchmarks for prior learning assessment and recognition, perspectives and guidelines for the Canadian PLAR practitioner. And in that research, there were two main roles, two main functions identified for those who worked in the field. The role of the individual who prepares the learner or the um, candidate for assessment, and then the role of the person who assesses the individual. So essentially, they looked at the advisor and the assessor. Interesting, in that report that did come out in 2000, there was also a mention of what was happening in Canada with PLAR at the time and that there was another rule that had emerged in Canada that we may not have no, um, found in the literature around 
practitioner roles at that time. And that was the role of the facilitator, the coordinator, the system person that was responsible for ensuring, along with hopefully a team of individuals, that RPL became a part of the way the organization or the institution uh, went to business. So there was nothing done about that facilitator role. There were some key areas in that, um, in that early piece of research that I just wanted to mention, and one of them was that the, um, the benchmarks took these key roles, and again, they're very, um, those of you, um, Susan, these I'm sure are very familiar to you, um, because they were based on a lot of the work that had been done in the UK. But Kapla took those, and as good PLAR practitioners would do, we created a self-assessment checklist and a self-assessment profile for those two roles. And we encouraged people, as, as part of that research project and continuing on for a number of years, to begin to look at their own qualities and self-assess their own practices as advisors and assessors. Then in 2005, we decided that there, were, there was this other role emerging, and we needed to relook at what it meant to be an advisor, an assessor, or a facilitator, coordinator, administrator piece. And the, we were able to secure some funding through in partnership with Mohawk College and the Kapla RFL advisor or RFL advisory committee. So that's the recognition for learning site and community of practice that had been set up there. And we decided that we would begin to really research this to see what types of competencies PLAR practitioners were demonstrating in the years around 2005. We used the developing benchmarks research by Zakos and Day, but we also had the opportunity to use some other work that had been done. Excuse me. And this, this was the work of Red River College, and back in 2002, Red River College made a commitment to training practitioners, and we had been running a number of training seminars and workshops, but there was a real keen interest in furthering that kind of development. And so we actually, in 2001, and finished in 2002, completed an occupational analysis of the field. And we did that through a process of bringing a group of practitioners together and taking them through a process to identify what knowledge, skills, and abilities that someone needed in order to practice successfully in the RPL field. And we found that there were some common competency areas, and then there were some areas that seemed to be specific to advising, to assessing, and to the role of the facilitator systems person. So we also used some international research at the time. And I believe, I know Gail was involved in this research project, and I, I think it was quite limited in 2005 in terms of international research. Yes, yes. So, Kapla went on with this project to identify further the roles of the PLAR assessor, advisor, and what we called the PLAR administrator, which in reality is often a facilitator or a coordinator. We again put what we practice or what we preach into practice by setting these up as self-assessment checklists and hoping that people would use them as part of their practice to become practitioners, to look at where your skill set may be, where you want to go, and to be able to perhaps document and provide proof that you actually are skilled at that level as a PLAR assessor, advisor, or administrator. I've got the website there, and by the way, this uh, uh, presentation as well as Gail's slides will be, um, will be posted. It's important to note with the PLAR practitioner competencies and in Canada that many people who are in this field are building on the skills that they currently have. 
So we see people who are coming into the roles of advisor assessor who have many, many skills and abilities. And they're often coming from perhaps the career and employment counseling field. They may be in the education field. They may be in human resource management. So it's almost like this skill set for RPL practitioners in Canada, and I'm sure in other parts of the world, is like that, an additional competency set that you may want to acquire. This is an example of the rating scale, which if any of you have used these for um, your own field of practice, you'll know that the rating scale has been adapted from the Conference Board of Canada. And it allows you to self-assess and rate your competence to everything from zero, where you have no experience with this particular area, to as high as number five, which says you can successfully do this without assistance and can lead others in doing it. This is just an example of those common competencies, and you'll see I've already mentioned those. You'll also notice there's the scale, but there's also the piece on the far end about possible evidence. So again, the encouragement of practitioners to actually document the skills and abilities that they have and to begin to capture that in some kind of way with evidence. So, um, this screenshot just captures the specific assessor competency. So if you haven't used the checklist, you'll notice that there's, or you'll, you will see that there are the common competencies and then the assessor competencies. And the key piece with the assessor competencies is that there also needs to be the subject matter expertise. And that is very clearly stated at the top where it says, assessor competencies for practitioners having the required knowledge and skills in the field of um, appraising the related learning. So that subject matter expertise is very important. These are the advisor competencies. Again, they go together with the common competencies. And when we get into the administrator, facilitator, coordinator competencies, these are the ones that were not identified in the early benchmarks research back in 2000. When the advisor and assessor competencies and the administrator competencies were compiled together, the information came from those three earlier um, plays, or that I cited earlier, the benchmarks, the Red River College Occupational DACOM that we had um, also developed into a self-assessment checklist and the further research. So you'll see that the administrator, facilitator, um, coordinator specific competencies relate to things like the system piece for RPL. They relate to things like education and training. They relate to um, practitioner development. So there's a set there that may be familiar for some of the roles that you're involved with. You can go on, this is right from the website, and assess your skills as a PLR practitioner. And I wanted to share with you, Gail's already shared one way, but I wanted to share with you a couple of the ways that we have use these as well as um, how other groups are using them and, and I, I, I learned some new information today in yest or yesterday in the pre-conference about how these had also been used. Um, so we're seeing them used as self-assessment tools. They're being used by advisors and assessors and facilitators. They're being built into, uh, for example, within our RPL certificate into the practicum component of that particular certificate. Of course, we're seeing them being used for portfolio development. We're also seeing that they have been used as the basis for the development of RPL practitioner certificate programs. As many of you know, there are two college RPL practitioner certificate programs in Canada, and those are at SIEST in Saskatchewan and at Red River College in Manitoba. Those are full programs. 
and both of those programs, I've mentioned Red River, but I also um, have spoken with Grant about this, and both of those programs were developed to ensure that those competencies were part of the curriculum and were, and were covered in the course materials or were appropriate for proving prior learning for the people who were enrolled in those certificates. We're seeing these competencies incorporated into job descriptions, performance appraisals, and projects. And I'm, I'm always amazed when I do look at job descriptions for this field to see how these are being used. We're not at the stage yet where we're requiring that someone have or I haven't seen too many job descriptions that are requesting a formal qualification in RPL, but there's certainly descriptions of skill sets that really tie in closely with these competencies. We, uh, the second last bullet talks about some further work that was done. And I, I do want to talk about this because Kapla, Kapla knows that we need to do further work in this. These were done in 2005, 2006. Five years ago, we know the field has changed. We also know that there may be additional competencies that RPL, PLAR practitioners need. And one of the um, areas where we did find new competencies that uh, have not been incorporated into the CAPLA tool was um, when we did another occupational analysis of the RPL practitioner field at Red River College for new curriculum we were developing. And we found that there were some areas that had not been included in the original occupational analysis we did. And it was interesting to see where these areas um, came from. And I, I'm just going to throw it out here. Does anyone know what those new areas might have been? If you think of between 2005 and now, where we're seeing a change in the RPL field. That's right, Grant. Yeah. Qualification recognition. That was one of the areas that we hadn't mentioned. We now know that there are, is an academic, and I believe, is that workshop on right now? The academic credential assessor um, work that's been done. But we also know that it's very important for RPL practitioners to have some skill sets related to qualification recognition and understanding what that means in the jurisdiction that you work in is, is, is a critical piece to, to working well with uh, any kinds of clients and learners in the field. Any other, um, any other new areas? I'll just mention a couple, and they may not be something, you know, again, this was um, with, with uh, um, Manitoba folks who were RPL practitioners from the workplace, from business, from education, so our RPL world in Manitoba who were part of this. But there was a, a definite um, distinct, or a distinct need people felt for very, very strong project management skills in addition to qualification recognition. And that was something that hadn't come out in the earlier um, work. There was also a very strong link to the need for high-level essential skills for, all, for everyone who works in, as an RPL practitioner. So there were some interesting areas that certainly didn't come up in the early, in the early research. I'm going to ask right now, I'm going to take a few minutes right now to see if anyone is using these competencies in any other way than on the slides. No? Okay. I'll move on. Now, in the, um, the brief blurb, we talked about formal recognition for practitioners. Kaplan's um, RPL Standards Working Group is looking at some guidelines for standards of practice for practitioners. What fits in with that, of course, is the training. And then what also comes along at some point is something that we've phrased as voluntary certification. Right now, there is no 
national certification body in Canada that certifies practitioners. But there are a few examples where practitioners get formal recognition for the learning that they have. And I mentioned, already mentioned the two certificate programs delivered by colleges. We also know that there are many other courses delivered by institutions and organizations specific to perhaps portfolio facilitator courses. We know about the great work of the Prior Learning Center in Halifax. We also know about some of the work that's going on within other organizations where they are actually um, training people but there isn't a, f um, a formal certification. So we currently have no pan-Canadian certification. We're looking at the development of additional advisor and assessor strategies and competencies. And some of those have been articulated in some, some of the more recent research around good PLAR practice. Uh, the research that was done on the quality um, the research with Joy Van Cleef and the SIAST folks and um, a few other, other folks on, um, on quality in, um, in RPL practice. That was done in 2007 and, and if you actually look at that document, you'll find that there's a section for strategies that are important for advisors and assessors. So we're seeing some additional uh, new work coming in. We're hoping that we will be able to move forward on some of this work. We know that many provinces are looking at this. I, um, I learned in our session yesterday and, um, that the New Brunswick NBPLAR has utilized the CAPA competencies in the development of some of their new curriculum guide and training. So I'm sure there's other work going on out there that um, would be really important for us as a working group to know about. I've put the additional links up here. And again, you can see there's quite a few links for information. Australia, when, when we presented this part to Australia, was very interesting for um, us to see what they were doing, um, and Gail's going to tell you a little bit more about that. But before we, before we do that, I want to talk um, about the, the part that Phil Mondor, and many of you will know Phil Mondor, he's um, with the CTHRC, um, the Canadian Tourism Human Resource Council, and he is also a board member of CAPLA. And Phil spoke about this project. Now, back in 2008, if you were in Banff, I think it was Banff, uh, we spent a day exploring some of this uh, work around standards and competencies. And this report had been prepared by the Alliance of Sector Councils, and it was about setting the standard. And it was prepared in partnership with the Canadian Standards um, Association. And this guideline would allow us as a practitioner organization and a practitioner group to go about setting some national occupational standards, perhaps some certification programs. I think accreditation would come later. But it's a guidebook and it provides some of the very important um, pieces and steps that when you go about look when you when you go to looking at national standards and guidelines, the 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 critical key things that need to be in place for you to move smoothly forward with that. So you'll see that they talk about some basic principles, and those of us again in the RPL field, these are very these are almost you know they're second nature to those of us that advise and assess and and set up systems but they're also critical to setting up standards. So the book helps you work through this and the system piece. So Phil presented on that to Australia, and again, Australia was very interested in, in some of this work because we've, ta of course, we all tackle things a bit differently, and Kapla had um, tackled this in a, in a different way from Australia. I'm gonna ask Gail to um, finish up with a, a little bit of information about some other countries. Thanks, Deb. <clears throat> Just 
Very quickly, when we were in the webinar with Australia, the idea of practitioner competencies came out in a very interesting way because the lady who was presenting, uh, Carrie Rock, <clears throat> presenting on a new model that they're actually using and doing some group assessment, group recognition in the workplace so that they have assessors going into the workplace to look at people as a group so that they can look at some of those skills like team building and like working with others and how they're actually doing things. So it was very interesting to look at the process of what they were doing. But she was also from there then taking a look at um, what the assessor competencies needed to be. So just to let you know, their definition of group recognition is taking a look at people in that group environment and so that they can do some assessment there, utilizing the evidence both that the individual can provide and the organization can provide to confirm the competence of the individual. And there's more information on the recording. I'm not going to go into that. But what they were looking at from their assessor requirements for being able to go in and do this workplace assessment, they must hold, and that is the Australian Educational Qualification, just so that you know what TAE is. They, it's interesting to me, the second bullet, they must be experienced workplace assessors. Now, there's a fair emphasis in Australia through the vocational educational system on actual workplace practical skills, this kind of thing. So it's not surprising that this is there, but it's interesting to us the way it's phrased for what we might look at if we start to look at additional or revised practitioner competencies here. And there's the content expert that Deb was talking about. And so it's not just the knowledge about the area that they need. The assessor needs to have the experience or the practical application as well. So she pulled out from that then some of the competency areas that they felt very important to do this group assessment, including the mentoring of candidates, which really comes a little bit to our advisor role in Canada and how we often talk about advisor and assessor being the same person doing two different roles in some areas. Facilitating professional conversations and activities. I found that a very interesting one to be able to look at. And in this case, if you're going to do workplace assessment, you need to be able to talk to the candidates who are there, ask them the appropriate questions, talk to supervisors, this kind of thing. So that was different from there. Assessing actively. And in all honesty, I don't ask me too much about that one because I'm not sure. And Deb, do you remember what she was talking about there? OK, we'll ask her and look it up and let you know. But it's an interesting perspective. Professional judgment. And they talked a lot about the judgment of assessors and being ethical and fair and the other kind of principles that we have and maintaining records. So from this, it takes a little bit into context some of our advisor competencies as well as the assessor and obviously some administrator, but assessors always have those administrative areas. So I just wanted to take a little bit of a look at um, some of the other things that are happening. One of the things that happened in the UK uh, a year ago in the fall was that they had a conference about using the European Qualification Framework as a tool for promoting the recognition of prior learning. And so because <clears throat> within Canada, we don't have a national qualification framework that actually relates and links all types of education and shows where college education matches university education and the different levels, et cetera. There is now a degree framework <clears throat> that is in place in Canada, <clears throat> excuse me, through CSIC, but there isn't anything that relates all types of learning to one another. In many other countries, they have national qualification frameworks, 
And throughout Europe, they have the meta framework, which is the European qualification framework that links everything, right? So each country has identified how their framework links with the larger one in Europe. And so within this, and somebody, I don't remember, somebody commented maybe yesterday, somebody commented about um, where RPL fits. Uh, Susan, you may have been commenting about this in the session, because within a lot of the European countries, where they have their national qualification framework, that's RPL's home. RPL fits there because it's not only looking at the formal qualifications, but it's looking at how the different levels of qualifications link to one another and how RPL fits in there at any level. So they have the guidelines and the principles of RPL all connected with their national qualification framework. So it's a full learning framework. And so in the UK, they had a conference and they were looking at how RPL fits with this, how they could make better use of the framework, the European qualification framework, because just been, I believe, Yolanda, the last three years or so that each country is showing how they relate their frameworks to the EQF, right? And these, I just put this up because it was interesting coming out of some of the results. Um, they identified still the issues of currency of learning and the variability of transfer value between different settings, meaning from college to university or from RPL to college, etc. So, you know, nobody's there yet. There's still work to be done. The key issue, secondly, that we're talking about now of training professionals that guide individuals through an RPL process. And one of the things I've noted in some of my recent research and look at different countries and where it is, is there seems to be, from my perspective of what I've seen in the research, a lot more emphasis coming on the advisor role. I don't, anybody else, Yolanda, you notice this in? Would, would you like to just come up and comment on that so that it comes through and people can hear you? Because the advisor is always separated from the assessor. And when the advisor doesn't do a good job, um, the candidate will have will problems with making his portfolio assessments. I work at a university and we only work with portfolio assessments. So that makes it a little bit different, I, I guess. But we recognize the importance of the advisor. And we have a, a, a separate description for his role. And did the competencies that were put up here for ours meet? Well, I know you only saw a few, but yeah. it would be interesting to look at those competencies yeah. and yeah. See, share them afterwards. Yeah. Great. Thank I you. recognize them. Thank you. And I also noted that it comes now more emphasis with the advisor, and particularly, again, when I look at Europe, in their emphasis on lifelong learning. And they have what they refer to as lifelong learning counselors meaning that everybody has the right to get counseling throughout their life as they change in careers or move on from one area of work to another, and that it is recognized, first of all, that it's not just to get that first education and then the stop, but it, that it's a lifelong learning process. And I particularly like the phrase that was used as far as lifelong learning counselor. If you want more information on that, there's a lot of it on um, the, the European, the CEDAPOP, CEDAPOP website. I, I'll put it up afterwards, but um, it was a very interesting perspective from there. Um, and then the last one just confirms that. So I mentioned this in terms of the lifelong learning counselors. Now, I think this is, um, I see some of my counselor friends in the back. In Canada, within the counseling area now, there is more emphasis and recognition of the competencies of RPL, right? Can somebody answer because I think in Canada is there, a, is there 
some discussion of certification of counseling, employment counselors. One of the other titles I just wanted to put up because I found it interesting, there is a four-year program just starting in South Africa to look at some of the centers that do recognition of prior learning. Huge number of people are putting through the process, a lot of it for access to education in South Africa. But they're looking, and there was a term used by some when they're referring to them as mentor or boundary worker in South Africa. And the reason that they were using this is because they see it as the transition between the world of work and academia in trying to assist so many people who have had employment but not been given the opportunity for further formal education to first of all um, identify the fact that they do have knowledge and skills. Sound familiar? And secondly, to help them translate the knowledge and skills that they have learned in the workplace into appropriate evidence to be used to gain access or credit into academia. So it was just a new term that I thought was an interesting term to uh, consider when we're looking at this. So from the perspective of other countries and what they have in RPL practitioner competencies, most of what I've seen have been a course in terms of assessment within, say, a teacher certificate in Australia. A number of them are required, in, certainly in the vocational, to get the vocational education certificate. And there is a course in there in terms of assessment and some of it now incorporating workplace assessment. So we don't have, the, in other countries, I have not found yet areas that are strictly based on competencies of RPL practitioners and applicable or appropriate training that relates to that. So it's something that within Canada we might look at again exchanging and doing more in working with other countries. Um, if you're interested in the future of other things to do with, with iPlan and other webinars, etc., please sign up downstairs. We're kind of doing this as a combined uh, session here. And, um, and we will try and take a look at uh, future topics from there. Any questions, just as we finish off here, of Deb in terms of the Canadian competencies or other things that have been found or things that you are using or see using the practitioner competencies for? Questions or comments? Yes. Would you, could we ask you to come to the mic? Just because I know they're at the back, it's a little more difficult. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the academic qualifications assessment, do you see that as that should be um, separate from or uh, performed, I should say, by a separate organization or person from the assessor? Or is that something that's still being debated? Well, well I don't have an answer, but I'll, I will. Uh, thanks. <laughs> We, uh, this, this question is debated um, in almost every workshop that we're involved in around do we separate the roles of advisor and assessor? And if we don't, and I, how do we maintain the objectivity, the quality, all of that? So there's lots of discussion around that. I, um, I always like to let use this as an example to get people thinking about this in another way because we do have some firm opinions sometimes that those roles should be totally separate uh, for all of the reasons of credible quality practice. But I would like to suggest sometimes that when we are facilitators of learning in many environments, we don't separate those roles. So if I'm a teacher or faculty or whatever, my role isn't separate. I do advise and I do assess those learners. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to have that discussion. The, on the other side, I know there are many groups that have made the decision that they will be separate. So this might even be a very interesting topic to have and explore further. I know Susan would have some comments about what I'm saying and everybody in the room because I, 
I'm sure you have I, different opinions. But. I also heard another yeah. part of that question, though. Were you asking about whether those who assess qualifications, so internationally educated Oh, I'm sorry. Should be as well oh. with the RPL. Okay, assessment? okay. I do have an opinion on that, and it is definitely just my opinion. But um, I think that the international credential assessment piece is a very important piece to the whole work, of course, of qualification recognition. And I think there are probably some underpinning skills within an international credential assessor that they need to have some basic understanding around the field of PLAR or RPL. And I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing if that has come up with, with that particular project. It's like I mentioned that that was missing from the RPL practitioner competencies. And it's not that an RPL practitioner necessarily would be assessing a formal academic credential from another country. But it's that understanding so that we can continue to work together as those who assess, you know, people's qualifications or their, um, uh, their evidence that they're bringing. So I don't know if that answers it. Susan, do you have something you'd like to add about that? I'm putting you on the spot, but I know you were in the pre-conference yesterday and I, this question has been around for a long time, both sides of it, about the credentials as well as the training of assessors. And what I really think as we have technology coming uh, more and more to the forefront, I think a lot will depend on the training that we give assessors. Because as we talked about yesterday, assessment is no longer just going to be about portfolios. I think assessors are going to have to learn to use a range of other techniques effectively, and so they'll have to be trained in that. And I also think the role of advisors is going to change because people can get a lot of support now through online support, and the role of the actual one-on-one, -on -one, the way we're used to for you know the last 30 years, I think that role will continue to evolve. So I agree with Deb. I think it's something we want to look at because the two roles are changing dramatically through the use of technology and through the expansion or the merger of competence-based assessment with the concept of the recognition of prior learning. But there is a lot more to say. Okay, and it is almost lunch, but I did want to add another piece, and this is part of the RPL Standards Working Group. The importance of the field of practice and practitioner competencies and roles, but the other piece to that, and those are the standards and guidelines for the field of practice. So the more we have robust standards for the field of RPL, then the better, I, I think, we're, we're better able to further define the competencies of the roles. Okay, so right now in Canada, we have some basic standards around this field of practice but we haven't fully explored them to the degree that we probably need to do. So just um, in closing, I, I think Gail will probably have one more comment um, as well, but I just wanted to welcome any new participants to the RPL Standards Working Group. We, uh, there is a sign-up sheet downstairs or to iPlan. The, um, we will send out a further update, many of our original 14 to 18 people were on the webinar and um, have received a bit of an update about uh, the work. But there is an opportunity to do some more work and, and Kapla would certainly be pleased to have any of your participation in that working group. Thank you, I think it is noon. If there are any other questions that people have or resources that you'd like to share with Deb that you've been using for this kind of thing, please, we'd be more than happy to have it. But thank you today and hopefully you'll all sign up for continued input downstairs. Thanks so much, folks. Enjoy your lunch.